So that's joint work with Craig and Chris Picard and Nigel Smart. Um, so let's just a uh, quick reminder of uh, what we do when we want to do amorphic encryption over cyclotomic rings. Uh, just a little bit of notation. K is going to be the number field, uh, the mth cyclotomic number field, which we can sometimes think of uh, the ring of polynomial modulo the mth cyclotomic polynomial. Uh, the ring of integers, the same thing. Uh, and the mod Q varieties, which is you know, what you get when you take the ring and, and mod it uh, by Q. Um, we're going to have two particular mod things that we'll be interested in. One is Q, which is a parameter and is big, and the other one is 2, which is 2, and it's small. Uh, <laughs> in general, 2 could be a P that's su sufficiently smaller than Q, but in this talk, it's always going to be 2. So. Um, then the ciphertexts and the secret keys are all vector over uh, Rm mod Q. And the ciphertext C is valid with respect to a secret key S, and it's encrypt an element A in the mod 2 version. Um, if uh, the following equality holds, when you take the inner product in Rq, what you get is this. Uh, now, that's not really well defined because A is not in, mod in, in the ring mod Q. So you lift everything to the ring itself, and you pick appropriate representatives, and the appropriate representatives are the, you know, the shortest representative in their class, and then that now everything is well defined, and this equality uh, holds. Um, so this thing is an element in uh, Rm, that thing is an element uh, in Rm. Now you can see whether they both belong to the same equivalent class mod Q, and then uh, that makes it well defined. Uh, if that end, most importantly, this E has to be small. Small meaning a lot smaller than Q over 2 in uh, whatever norm you choose to work in. So let's say uh, canonical embedding norm Euclidean, just for concreteness. Um, and if that's true, then it's not particularly hard to show, modulo something, uh, it's not particularly hard to show that a way to actually recover this A is to take the inner product in RQ, express it in appropriate basis, uh, let's say the polynomial, uh, the, the coefficient basis of, of, uh, of things, and then just take the most significant bits of all the coefficients. And the coefficient basis is not the best one you can use, but it's good enough, and, and it's nice to think of. So. Um, so yeah, you take the inner product in RQ, you represent it as a, as a linear combination of some basis vectors, you take the most significant bit of all the coefficients, and then you compute A as that 0, 1 coefficient, uh, the 0, 1 combination of basically the same basis of RQ2, of RM2. <coughs> Yeah, throughout the talk there are going to be a few asterisks. I'm lying here and there, and there would be uh, there would be one slide about two thirds of the way when I explain where I explain why I'm lying, and after that we will forget about it and keep having these asterisks. Um, okay. How do we use this? So the thing that the crypto system encrypts natively are binary polynomials, L, uh, polynomials in R, M, 2. Uh, but the thing we're really interested in, the thing we really want to encrypt are, let's say, bits. Uh, so every binary polynomial would encode some bits. And the particular way we choose uh, for encoding, we choose this way because it's the most efficient way to go. It's not because it's the only way you can do it. Um, is every uh, native plaintext encodes a whole bunch of, uh, of element from some uh, extension field, gf2 to the d for some d, and there are l of them for some l. Is your m odd? m is going to be odd, even though in a couple of slides there would be a sub-bullet say from now on let's assume that m is odd. 
Uh, it, you can do the same thing when M is even, but then you have ramifications and you can bas basically lose out on efficiency parameters. Well, if, if, if M is a power of two, then that would be, yeah, that would be G of two to the zero, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, if, if, G is a, if, if, uh, if it's a power of two, then you cannot encode it. In this, in this case, you, can, you don't have to encode it as just a constant zero or one. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's definitely, I don't want M to be a power of two here. Uh, and at some point, it will be odd. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the particular encoding. Actually, it would play quite an important role in, in, in what I have to say. Uh, but right now, let's just assume that it exists somehow and it has these properties that when you do operations, when you do plain text operation, when you add or multiply uh, these A's in R2, then what happens is that these, uh, these uh, plain, we will call these guys the plain text slot. You put a plain text element that you care about in each one of them uh, and they just get added and multiplied uh, component wise and you since this is a morphic encryption, then there is a way for you to do operations on ciphertext that would induce the addition and multiplication in the ring here, which in turn would induce the component-wise addition and multiplication GF2 to the D. Uh, you can apply the automorphism to your ciphertext plus key switching, which would imply applying the same automorphisms on the plain text, which will in turn permute these plain text slots uh, in some ways. Um, yeah, I get relative to a different key and then you apply key switching. Let's ignore that. Just remember that these are the operations that we can do. Uh, but there is actually another operation which is the key switching and it will play an explicit role later on. Uh, that's not a semantic operation. It's not an operation that we want to support. It's just an operation that we have to support. It's sort of a maintenance type of thing. We do things, it breaks stuff. We get things relative to the wrong key and we need to apply this operation to get it back relative to the right key. Um, so for every two keys that we know ahead of time, we can publish a key switching gadget. I'm gonna call it W. Um, if you remember from a couple of days ago, it's really a matrix, but I don't care about that all that much now. Uh, but if I, once I publish W, uh, I can use it to translate ciphertext relative to S into other ciphertext relative to S prime, uh, such that both of these ciphertexts encrypt the same thing. So C encrypt some A relative to S, and C prime would encrypt the same A relative to S prime. And in fact, it's a little even better. I mean, it's not just that they encrypt the same thing. If you take the inner product in RQ, take the inner product mod Q, then you get roughly the same thing up to some small error. Um, so this is uh, homomorphic encryption over cyclotomic ring, and the issue that I want to tackle in this talk is how big do we need to make all of these parameters? Because this, the, this talk is about efficiency improvement to homomorphic encryption, and these are the two main efficiency parameters that we have in the system. Uh, so the point of this slide is to argue that M and Q have to be large. Uh, why? Well, ciphertexts are noisy. We have to put noise in them, otherwise the system is broken. Uh, the noise grows while we do homomorphic computation. And if it ever grows above Q-ish, then, uh, then we get decryption error. So we, need, we cannot do too many operations uh, because otherwise the, the noise will grow. If we want to do more than that many operations, we need to take our Q large enough. Um, so we have some initial noise that we need to put in this, in this uh, uh, ciphertext for security. And then we want to do depth 50 circuit so we can compute that this initial noise going through a depth 50 circuit cannot grow more than blah. And then we make our Q four times blah. Um, But Q being that large, meaning that the ratio between the size of the modulus and the noise that we put in the ciphertext uh, is now very, very, very large. If this, this ratio is very large, well, this ratio is 
when you think of our, um, uh, you can think of the underlying um, LWE instance as an instance of BDD or the unique shortest vector, if you will. Uh, and the really the distance between the public key and the lattice is the noise. And the determinant of the lattice is something like Q to the power, whatever the dimension is. Um, and uh, well, the ratio between them is this ratio. And the, the larger it is, the easier the BDD problem becomes. So you need to take things in higher dimension to make it hard. At least, at the very least, you want to make sure that LLL and its, and its variant doesn't, don't break it. So, uh, so dimension must go to get, uh, must be large to get hardness. And asymptotically, the best that we can get uh, is that the uh, number of bits in Q is polylogarithmic in our security parameter, and M is quasi-linear in the security parameter. And for realistic setting, you can think of Q as being, uh, having 1,000 bits and M, the dimension being 10,000. And that's large. That's large. This is the, uh, the main source of inefficiency in, in this computation because you need to work with relatively large numbers, uh, 1,000 bit or a few hundred bits, but mostly higher dimension. Um, now, that's true. But as we compute, the noise grows. And at some point, we have a, a, a much noisier ciphertext, which means that the uh, ratio between noise and modulus becomes smaller, which means that if we could, from security perspective, it's now entirely permissible to switch to smaller, val smaller dimensions. Uh, and the purpose of this talk is, is to explain how to do this. But before I explain how to do this, it's worth saying that it's not exactly cl clear what this is. It's not really clear what we want here. Uh, so we have a ciphertext C relative to S, and S is in, in RMQ, and they encrypt some uh, plain text element in RM2. And we want C prime relative to S prime in some RM prime Q for smaller M prime. M is roughly the dimension of the lattices, and we want to get to a smaller dimension because we can, because security-wise it's fine. But if it's this, then it means that it's encrypt an element now in Rm prime 2. And uh, well, we can't have, after we do this transformation, it does not encrypt the same plain text element. Because originally we had a plain text element in the big ring mod 2, and now we have a plain text element in the small ring 2. So whatever we do, we cannot even set, if we cannot set our goal, even syntactically, we cannot set our goal as having a small a plain text in the smaller uh, ring that encrypts the same thing. Inherently, it encrypts something different. Uh, so the best we can hope for is encrypt something different that's related somehow to the thing we started from. Uh, and the particular type of relations that we want uh, is if the original thing encrypted the some set of uh, element in GF2 to the, L, D to the L, and the second thing encrypts the same thing, but GF2 to the D prime to the L prime, then, I don't know, maybe these guys are a subset of these guys. That's, you know, we're going to do a, a, a ring switching operation that, you know, we had a vector of element in GIF2 to the D, and we take the first half of these things, and these are the things that would be encrypted uh, in the uh, ciphertext after the ring switching. So we'll do it twice, we'll get the first half, and then we'll get the second half, and now we have two ciphertexts uh, that encrypt the same el elements, uh, but over smaller rings, so it's easier to manipulate. Them. That's one thing that we can do. We can't always get that. I mean, this subset thing we can hope for if D and D prime are the same, and otherwise not really. Uh, uh, but the goal of, our, uh, of the work would be to get things like that, and in particular, we will characterize what kind of relations uh, we can get, get. It is possible to get between the alphas and the alpha primes. The first uh, work of this type was uh, by Barkarski, Gentry, and Vaikutanathan. Uh, they had, the, they had a, a special case of uh, transformation of the form that we're looking for. 
uh, that worked when m was a power of 2. It was not meant to work with these encodings of g of 2 to the d elements or, or stuff like that. Um, they had a, a, a big ring ciphertext C and they transform it into two small ring ciphertext C1 and C2 such that the thing that's encrypted in the big thing can be recovered from the two things that's encrypted in the small things. Uh, and they use that and where M and M prime are, are one of them is 2 to the N and the other one is 2 to the N. Um, and that was used uh, for bootstrapping. I mean, uh, in, in when the dimension is 2 to the N, you can think of breaking it into even coefficients and odd coefficients, which is essentially what they did. What we do here uh, is a more general transformation. Uh, it works for any M and M prime as long as M prime divides M. It relies heavily on the fact that the M prime's number field is a subfield of the M number field. Uh, it takes an L, uh, something that uh, uh, a valid ciphertext in the big ring relative to S in the big ring and transform it into a valid ciphertext in the small ring relative to S prime in the small ring where S and S prime are things that were supposed, supposedly chosen at key generation time. Um, and C, C prime encodes some uh, native plaintext element A and A prime that each one of them encode a vector. Uh, so C encodes this vector of alphas and C prime encodes this vector of alpha primes. Um, and because M divides M prime, then necessarily D. So because M prime divides M, then necessarily D prime divides D. So also the elements that are encoded, they'll come from a subfield. And the thing that we get is this. I'm going to spend time to describe that in much more details, but on a high level, this is what we get. Each one of the A, J primes uh, is obtained as a linear combination of some of the uh, AIs, the linear here being linear over wherever these guys live, gf to the D prime. Um, and there is a fixed partition, you know, the, the first guy, the, this first guy depends on the first um, nine AIs, and the second one depends on, on the next nine AIs. So this partition is fixed and it depends only on M and M prime, but what linear combination we get Actually, we can get any of them. If we know that we want a particular linear combination, we can get a transformation that does that linear transformation. And in particular, if we want to get a subset, let's say that D and D prime were the same, and we wanted to get, we wanted the primes to be a subset of the non-primes, then we will use projection functions. And we can get any projection function that we want because they're all linear, uh, so we can get any subset. Uh, subject to this constraint that the first one here can come only from the first nine here, etc. So the, f the, the sets which a j prime depend on which alpha, which alpha j prime depend on which alpha i, these are fixed, but the particular way in which they depend it is only limited in the sense that it has to be a linear combination. It has to be a linear function, but we can choose whatever linear function we So the, the thing that, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, they're going to be about the same amount of noise. They're going to be a little bit more noise, but not, uh, but I mean, the, that transformation essentially maintains the noise. It just makes things smaller so that it's e faster to manipulate them later on. Be okay. Actually, there is, there, that's, uh, Vadim is right in the sense that I, I don't have an explicit uh, slide here to say how are we going to use that. I mean, suppose we had it. Uh, so here is how we're going to use it. Uh, you start your computation in the big uh, ring because you have to. The public key has to live in the big ring because of security consideration. And you encrypt and you, uh, you uh, do some computation. And at some point, you get noisy ciphertext, noisy enough so that it's permissible to switch down to lower levels. Now, I can't switch down to lower level nilly-willy. If I could, I would do that on the, on the original ciphertext and then break the crypto system because the dimension would be small, too small. I have to publish something in the public key that would allow me to do this transformation. I will have that maybe in the next slide. 
outside or something. So then I'm using that and I'm getting a noisy, noisier variant of the, uh, sorry, I already have noisier, noisier ciphertext. I'm using things equally noisy from the public key to get the same level of noise but in a smaller ring. Now that I have the things in the smaller ring and each small ring ciphertext encodes, let's say, half of the slots of the uh, big ring ciphertext that we're using, so I'm just apply, I'm going to apply this transformation twice, and now I'm going to have twice as many small ring ciphertext, but they, between them they hold the same amount of plain text slots. And now that they're smaller, I can, it's faster to compute on them. So I have some circuit that I want to compute in general. So this is just another one of these bookkeeping um, a transformation that I'm doing in the way. It's just meant so that the lower, the lower level, sorry, the higher level of the circuits, I can compute faster than I needed to compute the lower level of the circuits. Because the lower level of the circuit, I had to work with very, very large rings, and the higher levels, I can already switch to a smaller ring. In particular, it would be useful if I want to do uh, bootstrapping. How do you then go back? Bootstrapping, bootstrapping is not such an issue. I would have the, the decryption procedure that I'm implementing homomorphically would be relative to the small ring, so it would be a simpler procedure, small parameters. But the ciphertext that I'm going to use are going to be big ring ciphertext. So once I'm done with the bootstrapping, I'm actually back in the big ring. Yes, yes. Yes, because, because, the, because the decryption is simpler. The, the, the decryption, the homomorphic decryption is applied to an instance that has small parameters, so the depth of that circuit is smaller. I can uh, write. I mean, they, they right, right. I mean, they right. I mean, you can apply this transformation to the original ciphertext that have very little noise. It would work. The thing is, in order to enable that transformation, you have to publish some key switching matrices in the public key, and those would be more noisy, and therefore they, I, I, it's permissible to put them at the, at the small ring. Uh, and whatever noise you started from, the, the end result would have noise, which is essentially the sum of the noise of the ciphertext that you started from, and the noise in the key switching uh, matrix that you publish in the public key. Yeah, it is. It stays the same. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Precisely. Yeah. Right. So I have to say that uh, when we worked on it, it you'd see it's not a complicated transformation by any means, but it's a lot. Of, it's a lot of technical uh, things to 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 pay attention to. And the gain is not that large. I mean, it's, I, I assume that for bootstrapping the gain would be large, but you know, you can you, over there even if you just uh, save a factor of uh, three in the dimension, it's already a big deal. But for any other thing, the, the the gain is really small because you have to compute quite a lot before you get to this uh, point where where, uh, where it's permissible to switch. Right? M prime has to divide M, so it cannot be less. It cannot be more than half of M. M prime has to be at, uh, at, it's at most half uh, M. So it means that at least half of the computation you need to do in the big ring and only after a half or two thirds of or something like that it becomes permissible to start switching rings. So the gain in efficiency when you think about it as, uh, as, as computing on a big circuit is not quite clear. So it's a lot of work for little gain but actually I would have a slide at the very end of the uh, presentation saying well that the properties of the transformation that we get actually allows us to do things that are, are even nicer than that. Well, in principle, you would just com keep computing. So you so compute AES, you do the first uh, 30 levels on the big ring, and then the last 15 you do at the small ring. And then the last 15 would actually work much faster because uh, uh, now you... Uh, uh, but they
So you, you start from the big ring and then at some point you just switch everything to the small ring and then you work with that for a little bit and then you may, maybe you can switch to even smaller ring. Yeah, but that's, again, it's still easier to, to, man, to maintain two small ones than one big one. I mean, some of these operations are linear or quasi-linear, other one, and even the ones that are quasi-linear, there's a big polylog factor there. So you, you actually do get, uh, and some of them are not even linear, some of them are. Uh, okay, let, let me do an overview of the transformation. The transformation actually turns out to be very, very simple. Uh, especially for people that have more background than me in, in number theory. Uh, <laughs> so let's just, let's drop some of the notations because I don't want to keep carrying these M and M primes everywhere. So K is Km, R is Rm, K prime is Km prime, R prime is Rm prime. And the same thing for the uh, uh, mod Q and mod 2 versions of them. Um, the first part of the transformation happens um, in the uh, in key generation, uh, you, in key generation, you publish uh, a key switching matrix uh, matrix from S to S prime, uh, where S and S prime both live in the big ring. However, S prime happens to live in the subring, right? R prime is uh, is a subring of R, so you still choose it from the big ring, but you choose it from the subring really, uh, and you can have Uh, yes, this one. <laughs> Thanks. That has to be S. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. The, the first uh, the first S prime here is actually an S. Um, so you start from S and S prime. Both live technically in the build ring, but S prime you chose from the sub ring. Uh, and the first thing you do is you just do plain normal key switching in the big ring. Translating your ciphertext C to a ciphertext C double prime relative to S prime. That doesn't reduce the dimension of anything. You still have ciphertext over the big ring, and the ciphertext does not live in the small ring. But it's, uh, it's valid with respect to a secret key that does live in the small ring. Um, then you, can comp you compute a particular element in RQ that depends on whatever linear transformation that you want to do. I'll talk about that later. I'm not going to say much about it. It's just a single element that you compute. And the way you compute it is you use some linear algebra thing. And then, well, how do you switch from a big ring to a little ring? If you have some background in number theory, you'd say that the only way to do that is, is this. So this is what we do. You have just applied the intermediate trace function. I'll talk about the trace function. As well. And that's it. So as transformations go, uh, assuming that you know ahead of time what linear uh, transformations you would want to apply, then you can compute this R at the beginning of time. So the only thing you need to do is key switching followed by the applying the trace function. Uh, and this is, I mean, in terms of transformation, it's a very fast, very efficient, and also noise conserving type of transformation because uh, this element is going to be small. Most of what I'm going to say from now until almost the end is going to be algebra. It's going to be elementary algebra. Uh, I'm going to highlight three lemmas that we need. I'm not going to prove them. The proof is algebraic. Mm, yeah, sure. Um, and um, the only thing that's special about it is that you need to pay attention to particular representations of things. I mean, all the, the fact that there is a morphism from here to there and back is always going to be completely obvious. Uh, we need to choose particular isomorphisms for these things to work. So let me start by uh, uh, going over something that uh, Vadim uh, was talking about a couple of days ago. Uh, we need some geometry for the number field uh, and we use canonical embedding to get that, um, that uh, uh, algebra. So you associate an element in the number field with a vector of complex numbers with uh, phi of m entries in it. Um, if one way to, to do that 
Um, one way to think of, the, of that uh, representation is you think of uh, the element as a polynomial and then you just evaluate it on the, in all the uh, primitive m roots of unity uh, over the complex. Um, just an example, and I, I, I want to, to point out that example because it has something to do with sizes. Uh, if you start from an element that happens to be in the base ring, then the canonical embedding of that element is just that element repeated, um, repeated uh, pi of m times. Um, once you have a vector over the complex field, you can start talking about its size. So let's say L2 or L infinity norm or, or whatever you want. Let's say L2, really. Um, and decryption would work as long as the noise element, this E, has a canonical embedding whose size, let's say Euclidean size, is much less than Q. Uh, one thing that I want to point out is that if you start from a, a, a rational number, the size of that rational number isn't the rational number itself. It's the rational number times square root of pi of n. Uh, so, you know, if you wanted to get a really natural thing out of it, then you probably want to scale down by some factor to make sure that the size of a rational number is the number itself. It just sounds natural, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, it also doesn't matter all that much. Uh, one thing that's a little less trivial. Um, let's think of both K and K prime. K prime is a, is a subfield of K. Uh, and you can think about it as a, as a vector space. So uh, if you think of K as a vector space over K prime. Um, and if you choose any particular basis for that vector space, it induces, well, that's what a basis does. It induces a transformation. You give me coefficients, I'll, take, I'll give you the element that, that coefficient, uh, these coefficients represent. But now let's take, uh, let's take canonical embedding of these coefficients. So each one of these coefficients is represented as a, as a phi m prime vector. Uh, there are phi of m over phi m prime of them. Uh, this one has pi of m coefficients. So if you take all of the all, all the representations of all of the coefficients, you get pi of m complex numbers in here as well. So you can think of this transformation as a transformation uh, from uh, vectors over the complex, uh, be between vectors over the complex function. It's obviously a linear transformation, right? I mean, the whole thing is linear. Um, well, I, I should say that the canonical embedding is linear, I guess. Uh, so it is. Um, and what we want is a good basis. So we would need at some point in the argument, we would need the fact that there exists a basis. If you think of k prime as a linear space, if you think of k as a linear space over k prime, then that linear space, there exists a good basis for it. A good basis here meaning uh, that linear transformation is uh, almost unitary. It's the... the all, almost orthogonal, the difference between the least and the, the largest uh, uh, singular values of this transformation is very, very, very small. Make sure that the noise grow. Yes, this, at some point we would use that to make sure that the noise doesn't grow. So do you want this to be a basis of k over k prime or over of r over r prime? Also r of r over r prime, up to this asterisk that would appear at some point. Uh, and the first lemma says that there exists one. Uh, so there exists an R prime basis of R for which all the singular values of this transformation are nearly the same. Specifically, they're the same up to this factor, uh, which is a square root of the ratio between the radicals. Um, so if M and M prime are divisible by the same set of primes, then that factor is one and you get a unitary transformation. Uh, the product of all the primes that divide m is the radical of m and the product of all the primes that divide m prime is the radical of m prime and this factor is the product of all primes that divide. Uh, Does your basis consist of loops of unity? Uh, uh, yeah, in that sense, yes. Uh, the proof is actually, so proof of the same statement where k prime, where r prime was q, appeared in uh, Vadim's uh, paper, the toolkit paper. It does, believe me. <laughs> um, 
And so, you know, basically there is a basis of Q over K and another basis of Q of, uh, sorry, there is a basis of K over Q and another basis of Q K prime over Q. And this basis is basically one times the inverse of the other is essentially what it is. And it works. I mean, it works because everything is a tensor product and behave nicely. It's, uh, again, it's this algebra, but it's a lot of it. But other than that. So this is one lemma that we will need at some point. In the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about the trace function that we're using. So there are mo there's more than one way to define the trace function, and this is not the most elegant of, of, of which, but it is the one that uses the, the notation that I already have on the slide and doesn't uh, force me to introduce more. So I'll use that one. So the trace function um, maps element of the big number field into uh, the rationals. And basically, you take all the entries of the canonical embedding and, and uh, sum them up. Um, magically, it happens to live in the base field. Uh, and one thing that you, it's, it's completely obvious by that definition is if you start from a small element, uh, meaning that its canonical embedding is small, then you end up with a small rational because all you did is add these small elements. So you can get too much larger. Uh, another property of this trace function is that it's Q-linear and in general, and, and uh, just to get the definition on, uh, out of the way, a function is Q-linear if it's closed under addition and under multiplications with, um, with elements of Q. Um, and not only it's Q-linear, in some sense it's the Q-linear function. Uh, any function that's Q-linear you, um, uh, you can express that has to be any function that's Q-linear, you can express as applying the trace after multiplying by some constant from the uh, big ring. So let me read this thing. For every Q-linear function, L, there exists some kappa in the number field such that the function, the, the Q-linear, any Q-linear functions from the big ring to Q. Um, there exists some L such that you can get, there exists some kappa such you can get uh, L by just multiplying by kappa and then taking the trace. And kappa is unique. And kappa is unique. You can do this exact same thing for things that are Z linear over R instead of Q linear over K or Z Q linear over R Q. Uh, so you get for every Z li linear function from the ring of integers to the rational integers, uh, you can always write it as multiplying by kappa and then taking the trace. Kappa doesn't necessarily need to be an integer. And it would tie into the asterisk that I have in, on the slides every so often. But well, lift it to k, multiply by, by this, take the, the trace, you will get an integer. Well, you can think of it as, as embedded in, in, in the, the field of fraction, multiply by kappa in the field of fraction, oh, take so the trace, you do it. Yeah, yeah. All right, so that was the trace function. Now let's talk about the intermediate trace function. Uh, you can similarly define the intermediate trace function. Uh, the yeah. <laughs> and if you would switch these two, then it would be true that uh, you can compose the two. You can first uh, map things from K to K prime and then map them da down to Q. And you would get the same thing that you would have gotten by applying the trace function. If I had written my trace initially in a more algebraic way, then I could actually write a very simple equation here that defines the intermediate trace function. Uh, but since I defined it over C, then in order to do that, I would have to talk about how to embed K prime in C, and I don't want to do that. So it just exists, and it satisfies that. And the second lemma that we will need at some point is that it still holds a little less trivially than before, 
the, that if you take an element of the big field and apply the intermediate trace for it, you get an element of the small field and the size in terms of the norm of the canonical embedding doesn't grow much. Uh, it's not hard to show. I mean, this, this, is, this is just a couple of lines of algebra. Because the thing you're looking at is not the specific embedded, the specific uh, complex that co that correspond to that to to that element of K prime, but rather it's uh, um, canonical embedding, which means that element plus all the conjugates. So you need to argue that they're all roughly the same size, let's say, or something like that. Um, it's I didn't say it wasn't trivial. I said it was less trivial. Okay. I'm good. Um, and the, all the things that we said before are still true. This is still a, a, um, this is still a linear function, in this case, k prime linear function, and it's still universal in exactly the same way as we had it before. For every k prime linear function L, there exists kappa uh, such that uh, the linear function can be expressed by multiplying by kappa and then taking the intermediate trace. And it similarly implies R prime linear maps and uh, R, pri R prime Q linear maps. And all of that, uh, as Nigel would put it, as interesting as wash water. Um, here is one thing about why I'm lying every so often. There is a complication in the sense that if you take the ring of integer and apply the trace to it, what you get is not the ring of integer in the smaller field. It's actually a subset of it. Typically a proper subset, maybe always a proper subset, I'm not yeah. sure. Not always? Yeah. Okay. But definitely for the cases that we're interested in, I think it would always be a, a proper subset. Not, not 100% sure, but it's it definitely, typically it is a proper subset. Uh, and as I, this is why I said it before. For many linear functions, yeah, I can express it like this, but then kappa would come from uh, the, re the field, not the ring. Um, it's a complication because what you, the way the transformation you would work is you start from a big field, big ring, uh, ciphertext that encode alphas and you want to get some particular function of these alphas. So you would apply this particular function, you would find a representative of that, uh, of, the, of the alpha primes in the small ring and then what happens if it's not in the image? Then you're all sort of stuck. You can't get that representative that you want to get. Um, it's, as, it's not a big problem. Uh, also, this one is not a big problem. The solution is simple and it will be on the next slide. But it is something that you need to attend to when you try to do this transformation. Yes. yes. Then you would get the same element back. No, no, no. Uh, you, you get, you get, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's not, it's not, it's not always an, an integer scalar. I'll, I'll, I'll <coughs> show what it, it's not always, it's, it's not always an integer. It's not always R prime times an integer. It's always R, it's always R prime times something, but it's not always an, a rational integer, that something. No, 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 wouldn't the trace of an element of R prime should be always the same? No, but you're talking, you're talking about R, right? You're taking an yeah, element no, of R. R prime is a subset of R. Right. So True. We, for some reason, we have a footnote in the paper saying that it does it, it doesn't have to be a rational integer, but it could be wrong. So, 
Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, we don't, I mean, this, that technicality is, is one reason why you don't necessarily want to make your ciphertext vectors uh, over the, um, over the ring of integers. Uh, instead, you would use the dual. Uh, and the dual is, uh, well, it's a dual. I don't want to say too much about it, other than the fact that it's actually uh, a principal fractional ideal. Uh, so it is R over T, but T is not necessarily a rational integer, it's just an integer in, in the ring. Uh, and for those, you actually get uh, equality. And moreover, every linear function between those can be expressed with an R that actually is from the ring of integers. Uh, which means that essentially also before we had things in the range of integers just scale up and down by these T and T prime. So this is not true. Which one? So what would be the R V? Okay. Yeah, there's, a, there's an elementary proof in the paper which of course being elementary doesn't mean it's true, but there is an element. <laughs> uh, but, okay. Um, and that is to say, yeah, let's ignore that. And let's pretend that everything works nicely. The last thing that I need to do before... Uh, uh, before I describe the transformation uh, is to talk about how does 2, our plain text space is mod 2, and I need to talk about how does 2 splits in the various uh, rings. Uh, so it splits, well, it has a prime factorization, but in this case, because it's cyclotomic, then it has this specific way of product i p i to the power e, where e is the same everywhere. Uh, this is the ramification in... Uh, this is the ramification index, and I'm going to assume that it's 1. So I'm going to ignore that E because it's ignoring it saves me a whole bunch of notations. Um, and each prime is generated by 2, and one of these polynomials, and the number of prime is, uh, where did I define G? Oh, here. The number of prime is exactly the, the number of, uh, of uh, equivalent classes in uh, Z Zm star over 2. And the degree of each one of these polynomials is clearly the degree of the, the order of 2 in modulo m. Uh, and the product, assuming e equals 1, then the product is 5m. And then we have this thing, which again, it's completely trivial as an algebraic statement. So R2, which is R2, uh, is just a, pro a direct product, uh, direct product sum, whatever, <laughs> of these. Uh, and each one of them is uh, isomorphic to GF2 to the D. Uh, and this is, how we, this is how we actually represent our... Uh, uh, plain text slots. So every element over here you can write using Chinese remaindering as an element modulo each one of the prime factors and that's how you represent it. Yeah. The nice, yes, the nice basis will be the basis of R the um, the R V prime linear or the R linear I forget the of of yeah but you you'd think you'd think of R V as an as a, as a vector space over uh, with coefficients in uh, yeah in R in R V prime right yeah and yeah and Right. When you do the, when you use this for actually doing homomorphic encryption, like multiplying two things, then you end up with things like R v squared. I mean, the the denominator 
you take two things from RV and, and, and multiply them, the denominator, uh, you get T squared. And, and you have to keep track of how many factors of T you have and, and stuff like that. So, so uh, can multiply when, well, this transformation is really just linear, so you never multiply things. But in the big computation, you keep multiplying stuff as well. Yeah. 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 Coefficients in R. Yeah. And you end up with R B prime. Yes. Okay. But you but you I see so you encode the elements sort of you think of them in the basis of R always in the basis of yeah. R prime. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's what represents the Right. And your A, your plain text is, is actually in R two because the this is just uh, coefficients in some way on the coefficients of R. Right. Uh, okay, so yeah, you had you had this splitting in uh, R. Now you have the same splitting in R prime. Uh, it's exactly the same thing with primes everywhere, and all of these things. I mean, since m prime divide m, then everything also. I mean, the order of two is divisible. The number of, of uh, the number of uh, primes is divisible, etc. So just a, a one picture that I'll go back to when I want to explain one of the lemmas that I'll talk about later. Uh, so you have this, right? Two factors into two uh, prime ideals in R7. And each one of these prime ideals factor into three prime ideals in R91. And then you get you know, the order of 2 mod 91, the number of factors, the order of 2 mod 7, the number of factors. So, oh, and, and the terminology is that these guys lie over 2, and those guys lie over P1. OK. Now I can start talk about what we actually are trying to do. And to be able to apply this transformation, I said the earlier, you need to choose particular isomorphisms between stuff. Um, so that, that R of a, uh, mod PI is isomorphic to GF2 to the D is clear, but there are many isomorphisms there, and we're going to want to choose one of them in order to, well, we actually have an element of GF2 to the 8 that we care about and we want to encrypt it, we need to represent it in a particular way as a, as a native plain text element. Uh, and the way we fix the, this, isomorph uh, this isomorphism is you, poop, you pick a particular m roots of unity in the finite field and then for every element in Zim uh, star over 2 that represents one factor of uh, the cyclotomic mod 2, which represents one prime ideal, uh, you put the pick a particular representative in the, uh, in the M star, and you define the isomorphism as, well, you, s you send the zeta M, which is the abstract M roots of unity in the cyclotomic number field, to omega to the power of W. And that sends it to be relative to the appropriate factor. Um, and the same thing for, uh, for uh, the primed version. And why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because it's actually important for us that we choose. We can, you can do any choice that you would make there would give you an isomorphism. It is important for us that the isomorphism that you use in the big ring and in the small ring are going to be consistent. So let me give an example. You know what, let me read this and then give an example. Uh, so the, you, the way you do that is sort of, there's an obvious way to do that and this is what we do. I mean, you take the, the primitive root of unity that you take is the, well, that has to be, that should have been omega. You take the, the, the big, uh, um, root of unity and just exponent it to m over m prime. Uh, and you take u and uj, if ui belongs to a prime ideal pi and uj prime belong to prime ideal pj prime, and pi lies over pj, then you want these two uh, things to be consistent with each other. 
So you just take them uh, so that uh, these particular representatives are equal to each other mod m prime. And that's what you need to do. It's sort of obvious when you go through the algebra, but this is what we really want. Uh, what we really want is, uh, so th let's start by thinking of a constant in Z2, a zero or a one, right? So you take that constant zero, one, and now, well, that's in particular an element of the big, uh, of the ring of integer in the big field. And you ask yourself, what are the things that, represent, uh, that are represented in these plain text slots? Well, if your constant is a zero, you really want all the plain text slots to include, to, to contain zero. And if your constant is a one, you really want all the uh, uh, plain text slots when you think about it as an element in the big number, in, in the ring of integer of the big field to be one. I want the same thing to happen also in intermediate level. If, I, if the thing that, um, uh, if my native plain text happens to be in the small ring, then modulo p j prime, it is an element of gf2 to the d prime. Now if I look at the same element and I think about it in the big ring, I want the thing that uh, it includes in all the slots that lie over this j slot to contain the same element of g of 2 to the d. I want the constant to remain a constant and to remain the same constant. That's what I want. Uh, and that's what this messy, comp well, I don't know, not complicated, but messy and, and detailed uh, particular choice of isomorphism give you. Uh, and if you have that consistent thing, then we get to, this is, I guess, the main lemma of, of that work. Uh, it tells you that for every collection of uh, linear functions, uh, this would be gf2 to the d prime linear functions, uh, that take uh, element in gf2 to the d, l over l prime of them, and maps it to a single element in the smaller finite field. Uh, there exists a unique uh, R2 prime linear function from R2 to R2 prime um, such that, okay, if you take uh, any A in the big ring uh, and you compute, um, apply, apply to it this linear function, and now you look at what was, what was encoded in the big element and what's encoded by the small element, then what you get is uh, the, sa the linear function that you wanted for the, uh, the, the linear function that you wanted for the finite field element. And since it's hard enough reading it, I'm just gonna explain what it is by an example. So here is the example from before, and we have uh, three prime ideals in mod 91 lying over every prime ideal in, in uh, mod seven. And we want to implement a particular li uh, two linear functions. Uh, we want that if our original ciphertext had particular things in the slots, then the new ciphertext would have L1 of the first three in its first slot and L2 of the, second, of the last three in its last slot. This is what we want, this is our goal. Our goal is to implement a transformation and these two linear function that map GF2 to the D element to GF2 to the D prime elements are the thing that we want to implement. This comes from the application. You can think of these as we want to implement a particular projection function. We want, to, we want this one to be equal to that one and this one to be equal to that one. So we have two particular linear functions that we want. The lemma says that there exists some uh, linear function on R2, from sending something from R2 to R2 prime, uh, such that we always get that. We take any A here that has something in the slots, we apply to it the linear function over R2, and we get A prime that has exactly L1 of the first three in the first slot and L2 of the last three in the last slot. That's what the dilemma says. And now that we know that it exists, then you can express it as uh, multiplying by something and then taking the uh, 
um, trace. And after saying all of that, the transformation is obvious. There are two points. Uh, I, I, well, I showed three lemmas somewhere, so I'm, I need to show how to use them. Uh, but the transformation is, is obvious. At key generation time, we have an element uh, in the big ring, uh, in the big ring, an element in the small ring, well, a vector over as keys. We're going to publish key switching matrix from one to the other. And then, uh, given uh, a ciphertext C, our first step is to do a key switching in the big ring to get a big ring element relative to the small ring uh, key. Just plain key switching. We didn't make anything smaller yet. Uh, and we didn't change the element, the, the R2 element that was encrypted there. Uh, and the thing that I want to spend two slides talking about it is security. Uh, I said that we publish ring switching element. And if anybody remembers from a couple of days ago, the thing that key switching elements contains are essentially just instances of LWE. So we published instances of LWE, uh, but the secret for those instances are chosen from the subring. So what can we say about LWE instances where the secret is chosen from the subring? This is not a typical case. The typical case is you choose the, the, the uh, secret at random from the big ring, maybe at random from a distribution that's con con concentrated on small element in the big ring, nonetheless from the big ring. Can we say anything at all about what security do you get when you uh, choose it from the small ring? And it's not hard to see that at best you can hope for security as hard as LW in the small ring. You cannot hope for to get security related to the big ring. Just you set up the lattice that you need in order to break the system and you realize its dimension is the dimension of the small ring. Um, but can you at least get that? Can you get something which is as hard to break as LW in the small ring? Uh, this, is our, this is the thing we started from. We said it's permissible to rely on security in the small ring. The, the noise to modulus ra ratio is, 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 good, is good enough to do that. So can we get that? Uh, and it boils down to what you need to do is to get LW instances in the big ring that have uh, secret from the small ring where the security relies on LW in the small ring. And the way to do that is this. Uh, how do you do LWE? You have your secret, you choose noise, you choose A at random, and you do A times S plus E. How do you choose the noise? Typically from a Gaussian. Here you're not going to choose it from a Gaussian. What you do is you choose many different little Gaussians in the little ring and take a linear combination of them to get the error in the big ring. That's what you do. And uh, right, let B, if this better, be any basis of... Uh, uh, RQ over R prime Q um, and choose all these little, ve little error vectors in the uh, small ring and get an error vector as a linear combination of them relative to the basis uh, and then use that for your LW instance. And here is where we use the first lemma that we had. Uh, if this basis is good enough, if it's roughly orthogonal, uh, then um, if the E's were small relative to whatever they needed to be small down here, then the e, e, uh, J's, then the E would be small relative to whatever it needs to be small, uh, small up here. Um, the only, I mean, there, you know, being orthogonal and being small is not necessarily the same thing. I mean, you can be orthogonal and large, but the, this is these scaling factors just pertain to how dense each one of these uh, rings is. It's not a real thing. Uh, where are we? S, S prime was, was in the small ring to begin with. But it's a small ring is a subset of the, uh, a sub ring of the big ring. So you just think of it as, as embedded in the big ring. So A is, A is in the big ring, S is in the, is in, is in the subring of the big ring. So it also lives in the big ring in that way. No, that's exactly my point. I need, I want to have, I need to have actually, it's not, this is, this is actually a requirement of the transformation. S prime has to be in the small ring. And I want to get 
an LW instance that is secure even though the secret is in the small ring. And it's as secure as LW in the small ring, and the reason is the theorem on the next slide. So the theorem, which is again, it's a, it really is a triviality once it's expressed in these terms, but never mind. Uh, if decision LWE is hard in the small ring, then uh, the LWE instance is uh, indistinguishable from random. And well, you can think of choosing the random element in the big ring as choosing many random elements in the small ring and then taking the linear combination. Well, it's a basis. If the coefficients are random, then the outcome is random. That's not a problem. Uh, you get the same distribution on A as you did when you just chose it at random from scratch. Um, then the B that you get is exactly going to be A I prime S prime plus E I prime, each one of these times the, the corresponding basis vector. Uh, well, now you, you need to distinguish whether B is random or pseudo-random. If these guys were random, then B would be random. So if you could tell me where B is random or not, I'll tell, I can tell you whether these guys are random or not, and that's that. So, honestly, it's, uh, it's very, very simple. It's not clear that it's needed. I mean, you could, might as well, I mean, we're cryptographer, we're, as, as contrary to what Vadim said, we don't have much of a problem introducing a new assumption. So if we didn't have this theorem, we would just introduce a new assumption and say, well, LW is also secure in the big ring if the secret is from the small ring, and would be done with it, but now we don't need to. Um, right, so this was step one. Step one was just a uh, plain key switching. I'm gonna be done in two minutes. Uh, step two and three, um, well, C double prime is en encrypts A relative to S prime. A encodes some vector. We view it as many small vectors, right? The first three uh, slots, the next three slots, etc. that kind of thing. Uh, we have these L, tar L prime target functions that we want to apply to these slots. We compute the... Um, uh, by lemma two, there, is, there exists an R2 linear function, and we can express it as, uh, as uh, multiplying by R, and then uh, taking the trace, and this is almost what we need, except R is, in, is, in, is a mod two element, and we need a mod Q element because we're applying things to the, uh, to the ciphertext, not the plain text. So we identify R with a short representative in the overall ring, not mod T, uh, and the short representative must exist. I mean, this is the ring mod two. Two is a small element, the lattice is dense. We can always find a short representative. Um, and now that it's over uh, the ring, we can think about it as a representative. It's, it's over the ring and it's small, so we can think about it as a representative in RQ, and now we're ready to apply the trace. So that's what we do. And correctness, okay. So this is an equality over the number. That's uh, the easiest way to express correctness is say, okay, let's look at how everything looks in the actual the number field, not mod anything and not even integers. Uh, so yeah, Q over two may or may not be an integer, for example. Um, for some thing which is a multiple of Q and for short error, and now, when you think of R as an element of the big field, uh, then you apply and everything is nice and linear, and you get uh, the linear function L applied to each one of these parts separately. So you call this one K prime, you call this one A prime, you call this one E prime, uh, and you get that. And because the way we chose this constant R, then A prime is the element is a representative of the element that we want in uh, R2. And this is almost all we need, except we still need to argue that the error is small. So we do it. Uh, why is the error small? Well, it was obtained by applying the linear function. R was a, sm was a small, well, the original E was small because it was error. 
R was small because it was a mod 2 thing, so it has to be small. Uh, so E and R was small, and E times R was small because, well, multiplication doesn't make the, the things grow too much. And now we use the, the lemma that says that the trace doesn't make things too big, and we're done. So just conclusion, a general ring switching technique. It converts uh, ciphertext over the big ring into one over the small ring. Um, Uh, uh, yeah, you can, I mean, each, uh, pla each slot in the small ring uh, depends only on the slot that lie above it in the big ring, but you can, it can depend in an arbitrary linear fashion on them. We can choose whatever dependence we want, and we use it to, to speed up computation. And let me just say one more thing about how to use this transformation, and this is a, a recent work of uh, Alper and Sheriff and, and, and Chris Peckard that will be in, in uh, crypto next week. Uh, what they show is if you do that, well, you don't have to use projection functions. You can do whatever function you want. And some linear functions are more interesting than others. So suppose what you wanted, you had an encrypted vector and you wanted to compute uh, the discrete Fourier transform on that linear vector over something. I don't know. Over, let's say over GF2 to the D, but over something. Uh, that, that plays nice with GF2 to the D. Well, what do we know about the discrete Fourier transform? We know that you can uh, come up with an FFT network for it. And an FFT network is a network of many small linear functions. They're all very local. All of them take like two or maybe four or, or some, some small number of, of input and produce an output. So let's use ring switching to do that. Do, use ring switching to do every layer of the uh, linear function. And then once you're done in the, in the small ring, well, you don't want to keep going down because you can't keep losing security this way, so just map it back up. You embed this small ring in, in some big ring that includes it. That's, that's sort of a trivial operation. And now you're ready to do another ring switching down. Um, so, and, and that, at least on paper, uh, is much, should be much, much, sim much, much faster by constant factors, but maybe big ones uh, than any other. It, you can use it to bootstrapping, and it should be much faster than any other bootstrapping technique that we have. And that's that. This this gets smaller noise and I well it's a little hard to talk about uh, m being a power of two because you don't have plain text slots then so it's a little hard to say what happens but you can yeah you can do it with m power of two when maybe your plain text space is uh, mod three uh, that would make sense actually to talk about it. Uh, then this one would have, it would be faster and would have smaller noise, but uh, I don't, actually I don't think I ever thought about how would uh, the, the original transformation work on plain text slots if your plain text uh, space was not mod 2. So I don't know if their transformation can be described in a convenient way as an operation on the plain text slots. Maybe what you get is some crazy operation that you need to then undo homomorphically somehow. I mean, there is some operation on the plain text slots that gives you the plain text slots of the new thing. But if it's too complicated, what you want is essentially the, the, the plain text slots that you started from. So if the thing you got is too complicated, you need to add homomorphically undo it. Now you're already in the small ring, so the homomorphic operations are, are simpler, but you need to do them still. Uh, I just had a small comment. Yep. Uh, there was one thing that you said, and I doubted it, but you were right. Trace of the RV is the Okay, okay. That's, that's good because otherwise that we would have a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Go for it. Yeah, yeah that one thing that you don't get too many times to say in your life. Well, <laughs> right, Hendrik was wrong. 